that I'm mostly working on topological data analysis, which you know, is TDA for short, uh, which is in itself kind of a wide, uh, are like a wide field of science. And I'm mostly focusing on two different things actually within the TDA research. Uh, mostly the, the interactions between TDA and exploratory data analysis and TDA plus machine learning. So I would say that those are my most two main um, areas of uh, expertise. And you know, as of today, I mostly talked about like the first part, you know, just due to time constraints. Obviously, if some of you are interested into the second topic, I'll be glad to discuss that during the questions or uh, by mail afterwards. <clears throat> so the purpose of my talk today is really to give you an idea of what are the kind of objects we like to work with, how does that play out in practice, and as Daniel said, if time permits, I will show you a little piece of code for um, the, the kind of piece of code that we use uh, all the time in our team, uh, and what are the possible results or theoretical results we, we, we seek to understand and prove um, on our constructions. So I guess first let's like give an intuitive idea of what i mean by exploratory topological data analysis um, i guess with this i mean really we try to produce descriptors or visualization of the data well, such as the one you can see here uh, which somehow has some kind of topological flavor and what i mean by this is that you, you seek to produce a space a mathematical object so in that case it's a graph for instance on which the topology of this graph represents the topology of the data, okay? And when I say topology, and it's a vague term, but that means, for instance, the loops within the graph or the branches of the graph, right? The idea, again, being that when you compute such an object, whatever topology you see on that object should, you know, indicate you that a similar topological structure uh, is present in your data. That's, you know, has a lot of applications, like for instance, in zero dimensional topology corresponds to the to clustering actually, to finding the different groups or clusters in your data. So computing zero dimensional topology gives you hints about the different number of clusters or groups you have. But doing some more refined topology like one dimensional or you know, a variation of zero dimensional that detect, that detect the branches can also give you hints of, about the different subgroups within the clusters that might be interesting to look at. So uh, at, at the towards the end of the presentation, I'll also give you some more concrete applications in genomics. But for now, you can really you can believe that you know finding such, such topological structures can really be helpful in terms of understanding really the groups and the structure of your data sets. Okay, so just a quick reminder about the basics. Um, I told you that we like to produce graphs like this. In Practically speaking, we actually compute things that are a little more general than graphs. We use simply show complexes, which are somehow generalizations of, of, of graph on which the topology can still be easily computed and um, well-defined. So just as a quick reminder, um, what I call a simply show complex is just a space made of very simple bricks called simplices, okay? Simplices have dimensions, right? Like dimension zero to point, dimension one is an edge, and so on and so on. And uh, well, mathematically speaking, a simplex is just a convex combination of points, right? Um, not more complicated than this. And then a simplicial complex is just a family of simplices that you glue in some way, right? For instance, you have those two different rules, right? You want, if you, if you put a simplex in your complex, you want that any face of that simplex is also in your complex. And you also want whenever two simplices have an intersection that the whole intersection, the whole common face is part of the, of the complex. So in practice, you, your four bit case is like this, but this uh, on, the, on the other hand is a, a correct simplicial complex. So really, for instance, a one dimensional simplicial complex is a graph, right? But it can be much more higher dimensional. <clears throat> now there's also, yeah, uh, there's also a, a way of building simplicial complex in an abstract way, right? Because I've, I've been, like I've just said that simple, uh, simplices are just made of points, convex combinations of clones in the Euclidean space. You can actually generalize this a little bit and define simplicial complexes in an abstract sense, but this is mostly the same idea. 
Um, now, the important thing to know about the reason we deal with simplicial complexes is that they are combinatorial by nature, which means that we can easily compute and run algorithms on them in practice computer topology. But at, in the same time, there are also well-defined topological spaces on which we can theoretically speaking um, compute, you know, make, make sense and compute top some topology. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> now why is that, like, how do we actually build those complexes, right, out of the data to do some exploratory analysis? Um, the, the whole reason, uh, the, the whole goal we have in that field is really to build complexes on which we can prove that the topology of that complex relates to the one of the data set, right? We want to be sure that whatever you see on your complex is actually something that's present in your data. And really when I say topology, for those who are familiar with the term, I know that it can mean a lot of different things like homology groups, homotopy, homomorphisms, and so on. But usually we, we only care about homology groups, but we can also extend those constructions for those who know to homotopy, for instance. But I won't dive into this thing for this talk. Um, so the whole idea about building uh, such complexes is really to group the data into to, to find groups of similar of data that are similar, of data points that are similar. And then to summarize in that complex how those groups interact with each other, um, what I call their intersection patterns. Just to give you a more concrete example, like you imagine you have that data set, right, which obviously is sampled from a circle. Then if I were, for instance, to group, to divide my data set into three different groups, right, which are similar in the sense that the coordinates are similar in, in those three groups, right, then maybe I can use those data groups to produce a complex like that one, which has the correct topology, right? Like this as the topology of the circle, which is the one of the data or seems to be the one of the data, okay? This, the, to give you an idea, the, the whole motivation behind doing this is based on a, a very classical theorem that we use uh, very often called the nerve theorem, which states like that if you take a space X and you cover it with subspaces, right? So imagine I, I give you that square and I, I cover it with four subspaces, um, those, those, those um, four sets, right? Such that the union of those sets is the space itself. Then you, you, a way of computing a, a complex out of this is really to compute, to, to define a simplicial complex on which the vertices, the zero dimensional simplices, the points are in bijection with the elements of the of the cover and such that you add a new simplex to your nerve as long as the corresponding cover element intersects in that particular example that's the complex you would get from that cover of that space right <clears throat> for instance the fact that u3 for instance and u5 as they have a non-empty intersection that part that's why you draw an edge between them and similarly, the fact that you have a whole triangle between five, three, and four is because those three cover elements have a non-empty intersection. Now, the, the nerve theorem actually tells you that if, if you cover it in a good way, right, under some mild assumption about each element of the cover of the family, uh, then you can show that indeed the space and that simplicial complex, they have the same topology, right? That's called the nerve theorem. <clears throat> so, it's an old theorem, right? But that's something we still use quite often. Um, in practice, what we think a lot about in, in topological data analysis is actually how to build such meaningful covers, right? That we can use to define complexes that have the right topology. It's usually done in two different ways. You can either parameterize a cover of a space through a function, actually, continuous function that sometimes is called a lens in the literature. Or you can use, and that's the mapper algorithm that I will just present in, this, in a few seconds, just so that you know there's a whole also um, part of the literature that do covering based on uh, covering data with like Euclidean balls, right? With a certain radius, and they like to study the radius at which you know, corresponding complex has actually the right topology. But you know, for today, I'll mostly focus on that first direction. So <clears throat> there's a whole body of literature on, on, on that particular method. So I really advise you to take a look at that if you're interested. 
I'll briefly summarize it right now. So <clears throat> the whole idea is that you start with your space and then you want a function that takes values in, on the real line, right? And instead of covering the space itself, you cover the range, the image of the function. And that's much easier because if, if the image is in the real line, then you just need intervals, which are easy to parameterize. Whereas covering a space that you don't know anything about might be more difficult. Um, that's usually, so if, if now if you parameterize the, the parameterize the image and then you compute the pre-image of each cover element, of each interval, you end up with a cover of the space itself, like this, right? And there's a little technical step on which you separate the connected components, right? Like I detect that I have two connected components here. So <clears throat> I refine that into two different elements. And then the, what we call the mapper in topological data analysis, it's just the nerve, as I just described, of that particular cover, right? And in that case, you can see that indeed, <clears throat> uh, I managed to get in that complex some of the topology of the data set, right? I, I recovered one of the loops. I missed the smaller one though. So there are again some conditions uh, with which you can ensure that your map, conditions about the cover of the range of the function and on the function itself, under which you can ensure that you have the all the topology that's possible to detect. Um, <clears throat> right, so that's just a formalization of what I, I just said, right? So you start with a space, a function, a cover, you pull back all the cover, all the intervals in the cover of the function under F, you separate the elements into the connected components, and then you compute the nerve of it. As I just said, this construction doesn't necessarily mean that the nerve theorem can be applied, but under some restrictions about the parameters, you can actually ensure that this is true. Um, now in practice, when you just have a point cloud, you might wonder, uh, some, some of these operations are not exactly well-defined, right? If you, just, if you don't have the, the space itself, with just a point cloud. For instance, when I said you, you have to refine the elements into their corresponding connected components, that doesn't make a lot of sense when you have a point cloud. So instead, you want to run a, a clustering algorithm and use the detected clusters as the connected components. Um, all right, so I've, I'll have a, a few words about the parameters uh, just before showing you how it actually can be computed. <clears throat> so as, in practice, as I said, you need a function, you need the cover, and a clustering algorithm for the connected components. For the function, there is no canonical choice. Um, if you have no idea about the data, usually people like to use eigen functions of uh, a principal component analysis. Otherwise, it's mostly prior knowledge, like a function that you know is interesting to look at on your data. There are a few other canon well, uh, functions, <clears throat> generic functions that you can use, but most of the time, like 90% of the time, it's either PCA or prior knowledge. For the cover, we like to parameterize that with the length of the interval and how much they overlap, right? The resolution and the gain. And you know, intuitively speaking, the smaller the resolution, the finer will be your, your complex. You'll, you'll have more nodes. So you'll have a complex that probably more representative of the topology. But at the same time, if your resolution is too small, you might reach, you know, you might reach the, a numerical limit and then start creating things that don't make sense. Uh, whereas if you take bigger resolution, uh, you have like complex complexes that are more simple, but also more robust. And finally, for the clustering algorithm, well, you can, in, in, practically speaking, you can use whatever you want. Theoretically speaking, we like to use hierarchical clustering because it's easy to use. And so it's, there's a little more theory on that particular clustering method. So it's easier to prove stuff as well. <clears throat> Um, just a side note, if you use actually uh, hierarchical clustering, that really means that you will take your point cloud, build a neighborhood graph depending on, on, the, on the hierarchical clustering parameter, right, the geometric scale, and then use the connected component of that graph to do the connected component separation step in the mapper, right? Okay, um, so let me just show quickly how you can actually build such complexes in practice. There, all right. Hope everyone can see my screen. Um, <clears throat> so the, the library that we work on in our team is called uh, Goody. So it has a, a GitHub 
my repository, I really, if you're interested in, I really advise you to take a look at it. It also comes with a, a whole set of tutorials. So what I'm showing right now, for instance, is one tutorial about actually doing some topological exploratory data analysis. <clears throat> so for instance, I'll just run a few cells and um, just to give you an idea of how, how we actually compute that kind of stuff. Let's say I have that one cloud representing a human shape, right? This is the step, for instance, where I select my filter, my lens function. And in that particular case, I'm using the Z coordinate, the height. And then there's a whole lot of different, you know, macro complexes that we can compute. But let's say for now that I just want a mapper complex on a point cloud with a functional cover, meaning that I will cover the function of a real valued function, the image of a real valued function. As you see here, you can specify the parameters of the cover of the function, but there are also methods to compute them automatically. So you don't even have to give a number of intervals or a percentage of overlap. And basically that's about it, right? The most important parameters I just have to specify are mapper upon cloud and the actual filter. All right, then I can, okay, skip that. I can compute the complex in, a, if you want, a kind of a psychic learning interface, right? Like in Goody, most of the classes that we use to compute stuff are estimators and transformers, um, similar to what you, you already have in scikit learn. And then we provide a few visualization. So for instance, if you use network X, um, that's what you get, right? That's a graph, right? And you can see some kind of uh, like a skeleton of the shape, right? Uh, you have the two legs here, with the two arms and the head. The nodes are actually colored by the value of the filter, right? So the highest values are in, of course, for the head and the lowest half of the, the feet. We also provide some more interactive um, visualization techniques. Like for instance, we also we can also produce like HTML files that we can then visualize in the browser. And again, as you can see, it's actually the same graph, but now we can play a little bit with it, right? <laughs> but still it's our nice human shape from before. All right, I think Time is almost over, so I'll quickly now end with um, an idea of the kind of results we like to prove on that object and uh, a few um, illustrations about applications. Uh, a big question that we have to tackle in practice is how to choose those parameters, right? In practice, how do you choose, for instance, the, res the resolution, the gain, and the parameter of your people clustering, the geometric scale? Turns out that, uh, can I skip to the theorem? If you, you can use a, a what you could you can show that using that heuristic to choose the parameters, then with some probability you can prove that the topology of your final complex is the same as the data. But it's always in expectation because um, it's all that, that result is stochastic in the sense that you have to assume that your data is actually sampled from a probability distribution that you compute your mapper with those heuristic and only in that case you can show that in expect you know the expected size or the expected topology is the same uh, than the one of the underlying say, uh, space you know <clears throat> up to some constant that goes to zero as n grows obviously the more points you have the more preci precise you are All right and now in terms of application so that's a trivial application maybe you can skip to something more interesting yeah for instance one of the application we used was in biology where we try to identify one of the simplest biological phenomena that's also that also has a topological flavor the cell cycle right the cell cycle is intrinsically a cycle something which is related to one dimensional topology so we what we did in that particular work is that we took a data set of what is called chromosome high c data chromosome confirmation capture Really, that means that it's nothing complicated. It's just that you will characterize a given cell of you in the human tissue by a distance matrix like this, which tells you how much chromatin is folded within the nucleus. So each column and row of that matrix is a specific piece of DNA. And the entry of the matrix is the spatial distance of those two pieces of DNA within the nucleus. So if you get a matrix that's mostly diagonal like this, it means that the DNA is mostly elongated. 
And that's interesting because that's there's a clear difference in terms of folding based on the in which phase of the cell cycle the, the cell is. And indeed, if you actually analyze a data set of such data and compute the mapper, you can formally identify with some confidence uh, a cycle, right? That you can also further validate by coloring the nodes of the mapper with some specific biological markers and make sure that this is indeed the cell cycle. And then, for instance, after that, you can use that to get a parameterization of the cell cycle, right? And, and uh, assign, if you want, cell cycle phase on each chicken and stuff, right? It's, it's not only that you visualize on the data that it looks roughly like a shape, a, a circle. It's really that you ensure that there is one cycle with some confidence and you can then use that to parameterize the data. There's also another application, for instance, on machine learning when we use the confidence of the classifier as the filter, actually, to kind of stratify the data to try to understand on which part the data, the, your, your classification method is more or less confident. Uh, but I think I'll probably already over time, so I'll probably skip that for now. And just, yeah, jump to the last slide, which is really, Michael was to give you a, like an overview, well, a, a quick view of uh, exploratory, uh, exploratory TDA. As I said, there is a whole other part of TDA, which is more about machine learning and descriptors based on what we call the persistence theory. Uh, if you're interested, obviously, I'll be happy to take questions. And otherwise, if you want to play with it, I advise also you to get a look at the Goody library. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy that presentation. Thanks also for your attention. <clears throat>